Shortly after its introduction in 1972, the 555 timer became incredibly popular, despite a small quirk that it has. This is due to both its ease of use and its incredible versatility. Entire books have been written on 555 timer applications. In this series of videos, we are only going to barely scratch the surface of what can be done with this device. I first began using the 555 timer in about 1973 or 74, just a year or two after its introduction. And over the years, I have built many devices using this timer, and they have been quite diverse in terms of what they did. Since those early days, the 555 has become the most popular IC in history, having many tens of billions manufactured, maybe hundreds of billions, lots and lots of them. And in fact, even 30 years after its introduction in the early 2000s, they were still manufacturing somewhere on the order of a billion per year. The 555 has three basic operating modes. We're only going to really talk about two of those. We will talk about the A-stable mode, where it acts like an oscillator. We'll talk about the monostable mode, where it is operated to generate a single pulse in response to an input. And the third mode is called bistable, where the timer can actually act like a Schmidt trigger or like a simple flip-flop. That's the mode that we aren't really going to cover. If you look at a block diagram, first of all, you will note that there are two power supply connections, VCC, which is your more positive supply, and VEE, which is the more negative supply. Now, I say more positive and more negative because you can, for example, make VCC a positive voltage and VEE ground, or you can make VCC ground and make VEE a negative voltage. And the total voltage difference can range in most versions of the 555 from about four and a half volts up to a little bit more than 15 or 16 volts. The standard version, if memory serves, will run from four and a half volts to 18 volts, but you can buy low voltage versions that will go down considerably below four and a half volts. So you need to check the data sheet on the specific version that you have as to what the power supply limits are. The first thing you'll note in the block diagram here is that there is a stack of three 5k resistors in a row. Now these actually just act like a voltage divider. The voltage just below the topmost 5k is going to be two-thirds of the difference between VCC and VEE, and the voltage just above the bottom one is going to be about one-third that difference. We'll see how this works in just a minute. It has been claimed by some that the 555 timer got its name from this stack of three 5K resistors. However, the actual designer of the chip, the man who actually initially designed this thing, claims that this is not the case, that 555 simply happened to turn out to be an arbitrary number for this chip in the sequence, and that it's simply coincidental that it happens to have three 5K resistors. Now, you will note that there is a pin labeled control connected to that upper voltage divider point. We'll talk more about that later. And that is also connected to a comparator. And note that the positive end of the comparator goes to an external pin labeled threshold. The lower voltage divider point is connected to another comparator and the negative input of that comparator is connected to an external pin called trigger. Again, we will discuss all of these in future videos. We're just sort of laying the groundwork here. Now, the outputs of those two comparators go to an SR flip-flop. The top one goes to the reset, the bottom one goes to the set. We'll see how all this works together very soon. 
There is also an asynchronous reset pin, which is active low. If you pull that pin low, it will reset that flip-flop, blam, right then. There is a transistor, which is actually designed to discharge a timing capacitor. And that transistor can be turned on either by the reset pin through that transistor up near the top, or it can be discharged by the flip-flop going low. Now note that if the flip-flop goes low, the output is inverted, which means that if the flip-flop itself is low, that point in between the flip-flop and that final inverter is high, which turns on that discharge transistor. And then, of course, you've got that final inverter to flip it back over, and that is your final output. With all of that said, there is one thing that I want to mention right at the beginning here. And this is the primary quirk of the 555 timer. It has a real penchant for striking up conversations with other chips in your circuit via the power supply lines because it is relatively notorious for putting glitches on the power supply line. So the standard solution for this is to put two capacitors as close as possible to the chip between your positive and negative supplies, or positive supply and ground, or ground and negative supply, however you have that configured. The manufacturers usually recommend putting a 0.1 microfarad ceramic capacitor and a 1 microfarad electrolytic right there at the chip as close as possible. If you look at a suggested PC board layout, you'll see that both of those capacitors are really as close as they could be to the power supply connections. Conveniently, the power supply connections are both on the same end of the chip, so that makes it relatively easy to do this. In the past, when I first started working with these, I actually very often soldered those two capacitors directly to the two power supply pins of the chip so that they were really as close as they possibly could be. They didn't even have to go down a little short trace on a PC board. So, with all of that said, let's move on to our first application videos.